when I watched that last video, all I can think of is John and Tom. Yeah. And who? Oh, yeah. Because of that, that trail in the woods, you keep looking for that snowmobile coming through it for those guys, right? Um, so, a couple other things I want to mention while we got it. I emailed most of you in the church. If you're on the email tr list for the church, 50 good mental health habits. Thank you, Adam. Um, there are copies of this sheet of 50 good mental ha health habits on the table out there. Um, I highly recommend reading these and actually trying to own a few of them. I'll give you an example. Get enough sleep. I mean, how, it's so simple, right? But it's good for mental health. Um, eat properly. Worship together. Um, exercise. Laugh. I'm just giving you, a, 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 I mean, there's 50 of these. And they're explained a little bit. This is from the Christian Counseling Coalition, by the way. Brad Hambrick is a very good counselor, um, writer for us, for those who do that. Um, says, serve. I agree with that. It's very healthy to serve. Go to church. Believe it or not. And I've got to add this. There are people who tell me going to church does not help their mental health. That's because they're going to church for the wrong reason. The only reason that can be, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, and I understand if you've been hurt in church, we're preaching on suffering, right? My, my worst hurts in my whole life happened in church. And I still come to church because it's good for my mental health. And we have to figure that out. And you say, how hard was it? There were times I was very hard. Right. All right, just a few other ones. Um, get out of debt. How many of you have debt problems? Don't raise your hand. Debt problems that burden you and mess with your, mess with your brain. Right? Debt is a terrible burden on someone. Um, I'll just read. Don't worry about success or failure. How many of you worry about success? Right? That was the last one. So get a hold of a copy of this and read it. So now I'm going to really mess with things. Because we're going to, this is pain and suffering part four. Yes? Oh, good. Praise God. So I'm on screen live. Ooh, so I got to behave. <laughs> oh, well. Well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So pain and suffering part four. Our first message on this, in my mind, was really hard to hear. That is, we suffer because, because God loves us. It doesn't sound right, does it? We suffer because God loves us. And then our second message was, it's the will of God that you suffer. And if you're going to suffer, make sure you suffer for the right reasons, not because you've been a jerk. Right? I mean, we suffer for both reasons. The third message was last, uh, um, then it also said this, it's a privilege to suffer. Given to you by the loving God, it's a privilege gifted to you by a loving God. And you say, I don't get it. And I, I want to make sure you understand this. You won't get it till you're willing to suffer for God. You won't get it. So I'm, I'm thinking, Bill and Jen reminded me of this by just by walking in. They're back here from Papua New Guinea, and there's a family by the name of um, Peden that took your place. They have a little girl, a beautiful little girl named Abigail. She's what, eight? I got it right. They're in Papua New Guinea. She shattered her elbow. Don't put those pictures on again. 
you know. I mean, they didn't, nothing graphic, but just seeing this beautiful little girl, it took them four days to get to the hospital, or longer, right? She's suffering. I dare you to tell her it's a privilege given to you because God loves you. You understand? This is, this is really important. This is hard stuff, isn't it? When you're that little girl, she doesn't need someone saying, praise God from whom all blessings flow, does she? How do you get to that place? How do you get to the place where you can take that kind of suffering and just embrace it? Um, when you're hurting so badly, you don't want to hear that kind of stuff, do you? You want someone to comfort you, to hold your hand, to care. In fact, we might want them to keep you, their mouth shut when you're hurting that badly. Comfort and pity are appropriate and proper responses towards someone who is suffering. It is the right thing to give them comfort and pity. So Job is suffering. And if you know the story of Job, I mean, he, he suffered immensely, and his friends come to him, and they do what to him? They preach. And he says to them, he says, you're miserable comforters. Then he says this, to him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friends. Right? So it's appropriate to show pity. Jesus on the cross, Psalm 69, verse 20 since this is prophetically speaking of Jesus, says, reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. So Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's hurting, and it's heavy. And it says, I'm full of heaviness, and then he says this, and I looked for someone to have pity, and there was none. And I looked for comforters, and I found none. Those might be the saddest words in the Bible right? To have that happen, happening. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. When you are suffering, God himself is weeping with you. He is heartbroken with you. You say, but he's the one that let it happen. He's still weeping with you. First Peter 1.7 says this, that our suffering is more precious than of gold, which perishes. So I'm back to, I want to make sure you get this. Remember, we pointed this out. So God is offering you two things, gold or suffering. Which one do you choose? I mean, that's just mind-boggling, isn't it? I get to choose suffering or gold. Do you know why God gets so involved emotionally in this? Because when you choose suffering, you're, you're doing something that is absolutely incredible in God's eyes. Are you not? I mean, it says that um, our choosing suffering is the ultimate declaration of our wanting to love him, be with him, and serve him. And that we trust him. Isn't that what it's doing? And how can he not respond with that kind of faith and love toward him? So today we're going to look at four benefits that are, suffer that, that are ours through suffering or when we suffer with God. And I need to add this. You don't get any benefit from suffering when you reject God in suffering. The only benefits from suffering come when you turn to God and embrace him in the suffering. You will not get any benefit. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, But the God of all grace, 
That is the grace that you need in your suffering, the God of all grace. And the theme of 1 Peter, by the way, is suffering. You can't read the book of 1 Peter and not get that. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. There's something incredible coming at the end. Eternal glory. After that, you have suffered a while. Make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. And those are the four benefits in this verse. Make you perfect. Establish. Strengthen and settle you. So, but I have this question first. Where is it? Oh, I didn't write it. I thought I put it up there. But here's my question. What does God mean by suffer for a while? Right? Don't you want to know how long that is? I do. I do. So here's the four benefits. Make you perfect. That means mature. Make you established. From which we get the word establish or establishment. Make you stable and unmovable. Strengthen you. Settle you. That means make you calmer. Instead of hysterical in your suffering. Perfect is not flawless. Doesn't mean flawless. Nowhere in the Bible is it used that way. And I will say this we will be perfectly flawless someday, amen? I will see Jesus Christ and I will be like him. Um, that is, that, I mean, I so much look forward to that day, but that's not what this is talking about. The idea here is to grow you up. <laughs> and none of us are there yet. None of us. Um, Philippians 3.12. If you open your Bible to Philippians 3.12, I want you to get, we read it, but I want you to follow with this. Paul says this, not as though I had already attained. I'm not there yet. Either we're already perfect. I'm not there yet. I'm not mature, and this is interesting. He's saying I'm not really mature yet. But we're, that's not quite all he's saying. What he's saying, I follow after. I'm on a journey to that point of growing up. I'm in this journey to grow up, to be an adult. If I may get a hold of that, if I may apprehend or get a grip on that for which Jesus grabbed a hold of me, I'm on this journey of suffering. To grow up. Um, green berets. They want to be a green beret. Many want to, few get there. You suffer to get the cap. And guess what you get afterwards? More suffering. Because you're not done just because you just, all you did is you go to school, you go to high school, and it's a pain in the backside. And you graduate, and now you get the cap. You're mature, you're an adult, right? But you're not done yet. That's what verse 12 is talking about. Now go down to verse 15. He says, let as many as be perfect be thus minded. Now what he's saying is as many as have graduated continue down the road. Read the verse. Follow with me. He says, as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if in anything, verse 15 and 16, if in anything you're not fully grown up yet, you're otherwise minded, these are things you need to work on and improve, God shall reveal even this to you. In other words, keep growing, keep saying yes to God. Keep embracing the suffering of life to God. Because he, and there will come a day when graduation is final, amen? 
I mean, I have grown. Here's the difference. You have graduated from high school when you embrace adult responsibility. And there's an ultimate uh, graduation when you don't need to anymore. (laughs) Amen? We're on that journey. How many Christians have never accepted adult responsibility? Right? That is the first goal, benefit of suffering, to get you to embrace responsibility in the midst of suffering. Um, I've been reading, if you guys don't know who he is, I've been reading the biography of Gary Bykirk, who was Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, who spoke at our uh, Armed Forces breakfast, the first one. You want to cry. It's heartbreaking to see what he went through to get the cap and then to see what he went through to get the Congressional Medal of Honor and then to read what he got, had to get to get back into normal life. It was suffering every bit of the way. And he got glory. Peter says eternal glory, doesn't he? Eternal glory. And so perfect is not flawless, it's grown up. So the very first perfect person very first purpose of suffering is to grow you up. And I know I remember I mean we're going back a few years, I remember how much I wanted to be an adult. Right? Long time ago. Next, establish you is to steady you, to make you unmovable in the face of the storm. Boot camp for a believer is always the local church. You got to get this. See here, Gary, when he went to boot camp, was just starting. He was being trained how to suffer. And someone says, that's what the church is about? Let me ask this. Do you ever know any group of people anywhere that ultimately doesn't make you have to suffer in some ways? Does it exist? It doesn't exist. You can have moments of great unity. So here's what the boot camp that Gary went to, you took a bunch of guys, you're talking 60s, bunch of crazy guys, who were all about me. Diverse individuals that didn't know how to work together. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? And they they put them in a a joint suffering session called boot camp. And after, believe it or not, in eight weeks, that group of diverse guys starts feeling like one unit. Well, the church is the boot camp. How can anybody, and I've been down this road, so I understand a little bit, but how can we think that by not going to church, I'm ever going to grow up spiritually? If I can't learn to do it in church, in the boot camp, when we're all going to the same destination, how can I ever do it out in the world where the real war goes on? Amen? Amen? And, it, and, and we get, and we do, we get back out of shape. I mean, I, I, part of Gary's story is how Gary was a bad boy. That means he was on PK a lot, which means he was being disciplined a lot, peeled a lot of potatoes, did a lot of what they call toilet duty, because he was a, having trouble learning this team thing as a team. Do you know what happens in the Civil War, Battle of Bull Run, the first Battle of Bull Run, the North and South came together at a place called Antietam. And the North routed the South. I mean, they were, the guys literally were running from the battlefield. And as they ran, they looked up at a wall 
And there was a man named General Jackson, Southerner, with his brigade, and they were standing there in the midst of everybody running on movable. They didn't move. They stood, and he was standing out in the middle of all the bullets flying, and they, all those guys running saw Mr. Jackson standing there in his brigade, and they started rallying around him. Do you know what he's called to do even to this day in the history books? Stonewall Jackson. Suffering makes you unmovable in the face of the storm. We need that training. There's, and by the way, I've got to add this, because I've said it many times, you're going to suffer with or without Jesus Christ. Someone says, I'm going to suffer, I'm not going to choose suffering with Christ because I don't want to suffer. Good luck. Life is suffering. You're going to suffer. So you know what, what happens if you're not established, stable, you haven't been trained through suffering to stay stand still? You run in the battle. You turn and flee the battlefield. Immature men run. Not well-trained men run. Well-trained men stand fast, stable, and established. And you can count on them even when they themselves are in the storm. So here's Gary reading his story in the, ba in the battle. He has been shot. He's been wounded. He's paralyzed from the waist down. And guess what he's still doing? He's a medic. He's still dragging himself from wounded person to wounded person in the middle of the battlefield, taking care of him. Because he's unmovable and calm in the storm. So Jesus sets his face steadfastly to go to the cross. Luke 9, 51, it says, he steadfastly set his face to go. You weren't going to stop him. He went into the storm, not ran, ran from it. In Romans 16, 25, Paul prays to the, for the church that they would be established by the power of God according to the gospel. And it takes God's power to, make, to take feeble, shaky, weak, People like you and I, it is all the power of God to make you stand firm. There are days in the ministry where I wonder how I can take one more step. And some of you know that same problem. It is the power of God or it's nothing. In Timothy, in, in, Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, Paul says to Timothy, I sent you to Thessalonica to make them stable as a church. And then in 3.13, he says, I pray for the Thessalonican church that they will be established unblameable in holiness before God and all the churches and saints that are watching. Saints, by the way, or anybody that believe in Jesus Christ. He wants them to be like Stonewall Jackson, unmovable in the face of the storm. It takes training in the school of suffering to make you stable. It takes training to do that. You know, I've, I've watched races on YouTube where these runners are running long distance, and they have trained for years to get in these, get in these big races, right? In one of them, I watched one the other day. It was unbelievable. The finish line is inside, and they went down. They couldn't run any farther. They'd get up, and they literally staggered like a drunken person and fell over the sideline. They got up and fell over again, and then they fell over again, and then they stay on the ground, and they rolled to the finish line. You don't get that kind of finish without training. You don't. You don't make it to the finish line without training. And for us as Christians, this is the training ground. Learning how to suffer together happens here. This is boot camp. You know what, what, what Gary said? He said, there were so many days in my training when I was sure I couldn't go one more inch. And then I said, just one more inch. 
and then I said it again and again and again. God is calling us to something incredible here. Strengthen you. Well, if, 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 this doesn't, if you don't know why you need that, you haven't been listening, right? Jeremiah 12, 5 says this, If you, if thou, if you have run with the footmen and they have worn you out, then how can you contend with horses? Right? The cavalry is coming and you aren't even able to handle infantry. And if in the land of peace, when you have, where you're trusting things to be so peaceful and good, and it wore you out when there's no battle at all, how will you do in the swelling of the Jordan when there's a storm coming? How will you even survive if you can't handle peace? Right? That's what he's saying there. Um, Bottom line is this, it takes suffering to make you strong enough for hard days. It takes suffering to make you strong enough for hard days. You know how you make steel stronger? You get it hot. You turn the heat up. We call it tempered. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is being tempered. Not self-control, that's a different word. It's tempered. Heated. You know what 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says? God says to us in our weakness, when we can't think we can go another step, my grace is sufficient for you. God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. You say, I can't go on. No, you can't, but God can. Somebody told me the other day, I can't, they couldn't find in the Bible where, God, where it says that God never gives us more than we can handle. You know why it does, he couldn't find it? Because it's not in the Bible. God gives you more than you can handle. But he doesn't give you more than he can handle. Amen? He can give you that next step. This is really hard for me, partly because watching Bill and Jen, you know what I'm talking about. I've listened to you guys. They've lived this. They're the Green Berets in Papua New Guinea. Settle you. It means real simple. Quit being hysterical. <laughs> you know... You, you watch someone who's so calm in the middle of the storm. They've been trained. Or they're clueless, right? How did Jesus sleep in the bottom of the boat? Because he'd been trained already in suffering and patience. The disciples are in the top of the boat, and the storm is just, I mean, we're, we're dying. And you won't say Jesus is clueless. He's asleep because he's been made stable. He's been strengthened. He's mature. You feel, I mean, trouble added on to trouble added on to trouble will get in your head. Anybody's head. I, reading Gary's story is interesting. You know, as this guy was unstoppable and unmovable, you know what he did when he came home? lived in a cave for two years. It got in his head. We call that PTSD, don't we? Trouble is hard. You can't think straight. You're very unsettled. You lose your underpinnings, your, your foundation. Psalm 107, 27 says this, you are at your wit's end. And it's talking about being in a storm of the sea, by the way, if you read the, read the verse. You're at your wit's end. And by the way, being settled doesn't mean the storm stops. 
being calm does not mean it stops. I mean, Jesus did calm the storm, did he not? But he was settled long before the storm was stopped. Storms will unsettle you. Trust in Jesus Christ will settle you. This settling, this peace is only possible for those who weather the storm with Jesus Christ. It is the peace of God which passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4, right? But you have to turn to God in it. The blood pressure doesn't go up. The voice isn't raised. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It is asleep in the bottom of the boat in the storm. So I'm going, we're at the end. I'm going to, we're going to finish with a poem. And please read it with me. You've got it in your bulletin. I think that um, this is a perfect conclusion for this message by a guy named Adrian Plass. It says, when I became a Christian, I said, Lord, now fill me in. Tell me what I'll suffer in this world of shame and sin. He said, your body may be killed and left to rot and stink. Do you still want to follow me? I said, mm, amen, I think. I think amen. Amen, I think. I think I say amen. I'm not completely sure. Can you just run through that again? You say my body may be killed and left to rot and stink? Well, yes. That sounds terrific, Lord. I say amen, I think. But Lord, there must be other ways to follow you, I said. Boy, I've been down that road. I really would prefer to end up dying in my bed. Well, yes, he said. You could put up with the sneers and scorn and spit. Do you still want to follow me? I said, Amen, a bit. A bit, amen, amen a bit, a bit. I say amen. I'm not entirely sure. Can we just run through that again? You say I could put up with sneers and also scorn and spit. Well, yes, I've made up my mind. I say amen, a bit. Well, I sat back and thought a while. Then I tried a different ploy. And now, Lord, I said, the good book says that Christians live in joy. That's true, he said. You need the joy to bear the pain and sorrow. So do you want to follow me? I said, amen, tomorrow. Tomorrow, Lord, I'll say it then. That's when I'll say amen. I need to get it clear. Can I just run through that again? You say that I will need the joy to bear the pain and sorrow? Well, yes, I think I've got it straight. I'll say amen tomorrow. He said, look, I'm not asking you to spend an hour with me. A quick salvation sandwich in a cup of sanctity. The cost is you. Not half of you, but every single bit. Now tell me, will you follow me? I said, amen. Uh, I quit. I'm very sorry, Lord, I said. I'd like to follow you, but I don't think religion is a manly thing to do. He said, forget religion then and think about my son. And tell me if you're man enough to do what he has done. Are you man enough to see the need and man enough to go? Man enough to care for those whom no one wants to know. Man enough to say the thing that people hate to hear. To battle through Gethsemane in loneliness and fear. And listen, are you man enough to stand it at the end? the moment of betrayal by the kisses of a friend? Are you man enough to hold your tongue and man enough to cry when nails break your body? Are you man enough to die? Man enough to take the pain and wear it like a crown? Man enough to love the world and turn it upside down? Are you man enough to follow me? I ask you once again. I said, oh Lord, I'm frightened. But I also said amen. Amen, 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 amen. I said, oh Lord, I'm frightened. But I also said, amen. Lord, this is hard stuff. 
because every bit of my flesh says no and rejects the pain and suffering. But Lord, I do not reject you and I say yes to you. And Lord, I pray that those with me this morning, all of those here in this church this morning will say yes to being with you in the fellowship of suffering. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Every head bowed, no one looking around. Did God speak to you this morning? Hands up if anybody. Amen. This is hard. Amen. Do you sign up? Do you say amen? Lord, bless us this morning that we would say amen to you, that we would go through boot camp and do one step at a time and not quit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.